The Book of Enoch is a highly controversial and convoluted subject, enveloped in a dizzying haze of Ethiopian tradition, occultic mythology, esoteric mysticism, and uneducated assumption. The personage of Enoch himself is ambiguous at best, leading many people to conjure up wild speculations concerning who he was, where he went, and what exactly he wrote. Though the Bible reveals very little about Enoch, the writer of the book of Jude boldly quotes verbatim from one of the works ascribed to him, a quote which is referenced as prophecy no less. It is therefore logical to infer that Enoch is in fact responsible for some literary work. The question is, which of the many writings attributed to him is the real McCoy? In Genesis 5 we read, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Aside from a few more cursory references, the Bible doesn't really tell us any more about Enoch, even though he was obviously an extraordinary individual, extremely pleasing to God. Could the reason for the Bible's ambiguity concerning Enoch be due to the fact that his story was already thoroughly chronicled elsewhere in Scripture? This seems likely. If Enoch, the seventh from Adam, is indeed the author of a book, it would have been written long before the book of Genesis, which is generally thought to have been penned by Moses or by an anonymous author after Moses. The writer of the book of Genesis, whoever he was, would have had no need to retell the story of Enoch had it been already recorded in detail and widely disseminated, especially if it were written by Enoch's own hand. It is plausible, then, that the book of Enoch may have provided the foundation for much of the narrative of not only the book of Genesis, but the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, and may well be the very first, certainly the very earliest, record of human literature. With that in mind, Let's analyze the Book of Enoch. Many people do not know that there are actually three versions of the Book of Enoch, further complicating the situation. However, a mere peripheral examination of these three versions promptly reveals which one is most credible and worthy of consideration. First Enoch, otherwise known as the Ethiopic Enoch, was indisputably written long before the birth of Christ. Most scholars agree that it dates from at least 300 BC, if not much earlier. The content of First Enoch is Christ-centric. It discloses more detailed prophetic revelation concerning the Son of Man than any other known B.C. manuscript, including those of the Old Testament. Second Enoch, otherwise known as the Slavonic Enoch, also called the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, is most commonly dated after the birth of Christ, in the latter part of the first century A.D. The content of Second Enoch is theologically Judaic in nature, rather than Christian. Third Enoch, otherwise known as the Hebrew Enoch, also called the Revelation of Metatron, was definitely written after the birth of Christ. Most scholars place it between 500 and 600 A.D. The content of Third Enoch is highly esoteric. It accounts a mystical journey to heaven involving Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha, the high priest. In light of this information, it is apparent that the most credible version of the book of Enoch is unquestionably First Enoch, since it was written long before the birth of Christ and contains prophetic revelation concerning him. Because of this, we can decisively confirm or deny the validity of First Enoch based on the accuracy of its prophetic revelation and the doctrine of its theological content, juxtaposed with the teachings of Jesus and his disciples. But before we examine the text of First Enoch, it is beneficial to review its historical background. In 1773, the famous Scottish explorer James Bruce returned to Europe after six years in Abyssinia, or Ethiopia as we know it today, bearing with him three complete copies of the Gias, or Ethiopic version of First Enoch. The Ethiopic Christians had preserved the Book of Enoch from the early church era of the first century, and having translated it into their native language, inducted it into the canon of their church. In 1948, 14 fragments of the Book of Enoch, First Enoch, were discovered in the caves of Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Eleven of the fragments were written in ancient Aramaic and three in ancient Hebrew. 
Paradoxically, there exists a well-preserved ancient Aramaic scroll of the complete book of Enoch, which has never been published and is privately owned. Though the scroll has been carefully concealed from the eyes of the public, the former chief editor of the official Dead Sea Scrolls editorial team, John Strugnell, who died in 2007, was shown the microfilm of the scroll in 1990 during the Kuwait crisis. Gerald Lancaster Harding, director of, the, of Jordan's Department of Antiquities from 1936 to 1956, also testified to having seen the microfilm of the scroll. Whether or not the Book of Enoch is in fact the very first record of human literature is obviously debatable. However, its prominence and circulation in both the ancient world and the early church era is irrefutable. There is little doubt among scholars that first Enoch was influential in molding New Testament doctrines about the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Messianic Kingdom, demonology, the resurrection, and eschatology. The Greek text was also known to and referenced by many of the early church fathers, including Clement and Barnabas, who were friends of Paul, Tertullian, Anthenagoras of Athens, Irenaeus, Origen, and Justin Martyr, to name a few. In a second-century work on the apparel of women, Tertullian writes the following, I am aware that the scripture of Enoch, which has assigned this order of action to angels, referring to their intercourse with women in Genesis 6, is not received by some, because it is not admitted into the Jewish, ca Jewish canon either. I suppose they did not think that, having been published before the deluge, it could have safely survived that worldwide calamity, the abolisher of all things. If that is the reason for rejecting it, let them recall to their memory that Noah, the survivor of the deluge, was the great grandson of Enoch himself, and he, of course, had heard and remembered from domestic renown and hereditary tradition concerning his own great-grandfather's grace in the sight of God and concerning all his preachings, since Enoch had given no other charge to Methuselah than that he should hand down the knowledge of them to his posterity. Noah, therefore, no doubt, might have succeeded in the trusteeship of his preaching, or, had the case been otherwise, he would not have been silent alike concerning the disposition of things made by God, his preserver, and concerning the particular glory of his own house." If Noah had not had this conservative power by so short a route, there would still be this consideration to warrant our assertion of the genuineness of this scripture. He could equally have renewed it under the Spirit's inspiration, after it had been destroyed by the violence of the deluge, as, after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian storming of it, every document of the Jewish literature is, gener is generally agreed to have been restored through Ezra. But since Enoch in the same scripture has preached likewise concerning the Lord, Nothing at all must be rejected by us which pertains to us. And we read that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. By the Jews it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason, just like all the other portions nearly which tell of Christ. Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful, that they did not receive some scriptures which spake of him, whom even in person, speaking in their presence, they were not to receive. To these considerations is added the fact that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle Jude. Indeed, the writer of the book of Jude, as mentioned earlier, boldly quotes verbatim from the book of Enoch in the context of prophecy. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Nevertheless, by 500 A.D., Despite widespread popularity and endorsement by many early church personalities, the book of Enoch was virtually purged from the face of the earth at the hands of the satanic priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. It is no wonder, as Tertullian suggests, that the book of Enoch was rejected by the non-Messianic Jews and not admitted into their canon. Having rejected Jesus Christ, they could never have accepted as Holy Scripture a text which so boldly testified of him long before his coming. 
The Book of Enoch, perhaps the very first book ever written by the hand of a human being, proclaims the undisputed lordship of the Son of Man and prophesies with articulate clarity his millennial reign at the end of the age in accordance with, with Jesus' own words and the teachings of the apostles. Before all other known manuscripts, the Book of Enoch designates the coming Messiah as the Anointed One, the Righteous One, the Elect One, and the Son of Man. The term Son of Man is an explicit title, not a descriptor, and the one that Jesus most often, often used when referring to himself. And yet this term, employed as an explicit title, is nowhere to be found in the pages of the Old Testament, except perhaps on one occasion in the book of Daniel. However, it is the dominant title designated for the Messiah in the book of Enoch. When Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man, he was not saying that he was merely a Son of Man, but the Son of Man. What is the determining factor for, ins for inspired prophetic text, if not the testimony of Jesus Christ? We know that the whole Bible, cover to cover, testifies of Jesus, the Son of God, even in ways we haven't yet figured out and is verified by the very truth of its testimony. Those who have blindly condemned the book of Enoch without reading it, or weighing its content in the balance of the gospel, may be surprised to discover that the revelation of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of its message, a message which is addressed to the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Now, Regardless of mine or anyone else's opinion, the Book of Enoch must be judged on the merit of its messianic content. A cursory review of some of its pages quickly discloses the nature of that content. Keep in mind as we review these excerpts that this text predates the birth of Christ and all of the New Testament epistles. And remember the words spoken to John from the lips of the mighty angel in Revelation 19. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And in that place mine eyes saw the elect one of righteousness and faith. And I saw his dwelling place under the wings of the Lord of the spirits. And righteousness shall prevail in his days. And the righteous and elect shall be without number before him forever and ever. And I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of the Spirits forever and ever. And the second voice I heard blessing the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of the Spirits. On that day, mine elect ones shall sit on the throne of glory and shall try their works and their places of rest shall be innumerable and their souls shall grow strong within them when they see mine elect ones and those who have called upon my glorious name. Then I will cause mine elect one to dwell among them, and I will transform the heaven and make it an eternal blessing and light. And I will transform the earth and make it a blessing, and I will cause mine elect ones to dwell upon it. And there I saw one who had a head of days, and, it, and his head was white like wool. And with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me, and showed me all the hidden things concerning that Son of Man, who he was, and whence he was, and why he went with the head of days. And he answered and said unto me, This is the Son of Man who hath righteousness, with whom dwelleth righteousness, righteousness, and who revealeth all the treasures of that which is hidden, because the Lord of the spirits hath chosen him, and whose lot hath the preeminence before the Lord of the spirits in uprightness forever. And this Son of Man whom thou hast seen shall raise up the kings and the mighty from their seats, and the strong from their thrones, and shall loosen the reins of the strong, and break the teeth of sinners. And he shall put down the kings from their thrones and kingdoms, because they do not extol and praise him, nor humbly acknowledge whence the kingdom was bestowed upon them. And at that hour that Son of Man was named in the presence of the Lord of the Spirits, and his name before the head of days, yea, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of the Spirits. And he shall be a staff to the righteous whereon to stay themselves and not fall. And he shall be the light of the Gentiles, and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. 
All who dwell on the earth shall fall down and worship before him, and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of the spirits. And for this reason hath he been chosen and hidden before him, before the creation of the world and forevermore. And the wisdom of the Lord of the spirits hath revealed him to the holy and righteous. For he hath preserved the lot of the righteous, because they have hated and despised this world of unrighteousness, and have hated all its works and ways in the name of the Lord of the spirits. For in his name they are saved, and according to his good pleasure hath it been in regard to their life. For wisdom is poured out like water, and glory faileth not before him for evermore. For he is mighty in all the secrets of righteousness, and unrighteousness shall disappear as a shadow, and have no continuance, because the elect one standeth before the Lord of the spirits. And his glory is for ever and ever, and his might unto all generations. And in him dwells the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit which gives insight, and the spirit of understanding and of might, and the spirit of those who have fallen asleep in righteousness and he shall judge the secret things and none shall be able to utter a lying word before him for he is the elect one before the Lord of the spirits according to his good pleasure and in those days shall the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it and shed also give back that which it has received and hell shall give back that which it owes for in those days the elect one shall arise and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them for the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved and the elect one shall in those days sit on my throne and his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel, for the Lord of the spirits hath given them to him, and hath glorified him. And thus the Lord commanded the kings and the mighty and the exalted, and those who dwell on the earth, and said, Open your eyes and lift up your horns, if ye are able to recognize the elect one. And the Lord of the spirits seated him on the throne of his glory, and the spirit of righteousness was poured out upon him, and the word of his mouth slays all the sinners. And they shall be terrified, and they shall be downcast of countenance, and pain shall seize them, shall seize them when they see that Son of Man sitting on the throne of his glory. And the kings and the mighty and all who possess the earth shall bless and glorify and extol him who rules over all who was hidden. For from the beginning the Son of Man was hidden, and the Most High preserved him in the presence of his might, and revealed him to the elect. And the congregation of the elect and the holy shall be sown. And all the elect shall stand before him on that day. And all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall down before him on their faces, and worship and set their hope upon that Son of Man, and petition him and supplicate for mercy at his hands. And, righteous, and the righteous and elect shall be saved on that day, and they shall never thenceforward see the face of sinners and unrighteous. And the Lord of the spirits will abide over them, and with that Son of Man shall they eat and lie down and rise up for ever and ever. And there was great joy amongst them, and they blessed and glorified and extolled, because the name of that Son of Man had been revealed unto them. And he sat on the throne of his glory, and some of judgment was given unto the Son of Man, and he caused the sinners to pass away and be destroyed from off the face of the earth, and those who have led the world astray. With chains they shall be bound, and in their assemblage place of destruction shall they be imprisoned, and all their works vanish from the face of the earth. And from henceforth there shall be nothing corruptible, for that Son of Man has appeared, and has seated himself on the throne of his glory, and all evil shall pass away before his face, and the word of that Son of Man shall go forth and be strong before the Lord of the spirits. And finally, Enoch saw the Son of Man walking in heaven with the head of days, and asked one of the angels concerning him, and he, the angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice, and said unto me, This is the Son of Man, who is born unto righteousness. And righteousness abides over him, and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. And he said unto me, He proclaims unto thee peace in the name of the world to come. And for, for from hence has proceeded peace since the creation of the world. And so shall it be unto thee for ever and for ever and ever. And all shall walk in his ways, since righteousness never forsakes him. 
With him will be their dwelling places, and with him their heritage. And they shall not be separated from him for ever and ever and ever. And so there shall be length of days with that Son of Man, and the righteous shall have peace and an upright way in the name of the Lord of the Spirits for ever and ever. Again, I quote the words of Tertullian. But since Enoch in the same scripture has preached likewise concerning the Lord, nothing at all must be rejected by us which pertains to us. The argument of whether or not the book of Enoch should be canonized and included in the Bible is irrelevant. The only question we should be asking is whether or not the book of Enoch is true. Could it be that we are the generation who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed? If so, then the book of Enoch, written in the dawn of humanity, is addressed to us who are living in the twilight. I'm Timothy Alberino, and that's my analysis.